at the moment the gender pay gap for full-time um, employees stands at 18.8%. We also know that women earn on average 14,500 less than men every year. In Tasmania the gap is a little smaller than 18.8%, it's at 12.8%, but that's because average weekly earnings are less in this state than, um, than nationally. And we also know that women are less likely to be full-time employees. So only 35% of, um, of full-time employees are women. So they're more likely to be part-time and they're more likely to be casual. And this is what I've found particularly startling, and that is that the average superannuation balances for women are 46% less than for men. So looking at average recent graduate salaries for women, we find that these are almost 10% less than for men. And note that this is for a period that predates any kind of career interruptions due to childcare. So a lot of this gap is explained in terms of field of education. And so this contributes to the sorts of occupational segregation that we've already heard about in the labour force. However, even when you take factors such as personal characteristics, occupation, industry and education into account, average graduate starting salaries for women are still 4% less than for men. And we've heard about the position in leadership. Women hold just 12% of chair positions and 23% of directorships in agencies. So in the period January to April 2015, just 20% of directors in the ASX 200 were women. And we've also, you probably all heard, um, that in terms of CEOs, there are more CEOs in the top 200 companies called PETA than there are women. <laughs> <laughs> so in Australia, just 29% of parliamentarians are women and 20% ministers. And in higher education, which is reputedly a female-friendly industry, mm -hmm. only 24% of academic staff were professors in 2012, despite the fact that almost 50% of academic staff were women. So um, what is my story? How did I manage to perhaps crack um, the glass ceiling of academia? Well, um, for me, it all started with a good education. So as a white, middle-class, heterosexual 17-year-old, I did have a lot of advantages. So this was 1966. It's almost 50 years ago now, to my horror. <laughs> um, in addition, and perhaps somewhat unusually for this time, I had parents who expected me to complete year 12 and encouraged me to go to university to obtain a professional qualification that would enable me to be fin financially independent for life. And this, my parents strongly encouraged from an early age. So in 1966, when I started <coughs> in my first year at uni, only 27% of the students were female. And at the time of my graduation in 1970, only three in every 100 working age Australians had a university education. By 2011, this had increased to 25%. So while women were definitely in a minority in law school, in fact, in my year, it was the first year that there'd been more than one woman. I was lucky that in my year, we had a cluster at least of young women who really encouraged and supported each other. And so that was a huge help. So I studied law, graduated, gained articles of clerkship, clerkship and was admitted to practice. Then, at 22, I married, spent a year overseas on working holiday, spending all of my savings from my first mm -hmm. full-time job as a Chief Justice's Associate. So home again in 1972, I found some temporary work as a lawyer and started applying for more permanent jobs. And my first um, job application was for a lecturing position at the university, um, but I wasn't successful. <coughs> However, I managed to find a job in a legal firm without too much difficulty. So in those days, there were um, plenty of legal jobs. However, they offered no flexibility at all, no maternity leave, no fractional or part-time jobs. Um, they were just unheard of. And 
Additionally, childcare was really difficult to find and expensive, and the University creche on campus hadn't yet opened. So expecting my first child, I had to abandon the job in the legal firm before I'd even started it. So lack of flexible employment in legal practice, lack of maternity leave and those kinds of um, arrangements was the first obstacle that I encountered. But I had been doing some tutoring, casual tutoring work at the university. So I continued to do that after my first baby was born in 1973, tutoring in commercial law and in criminal law. And then in 1975, I enrolled in a research higher degree, had another baby, and was working and studying with um, childcare for two days a week. Um, Postgraduate scholarships were available, but only for full-time students. They weren't available for part-time or on a fractional basis. So by this time, the University Childcare Centre had opened, but without a scholarship, I had no income to pay for childcare while studying, and I just didn't think that I could commit to working the 35 hours a week that you needed to commit to, to take or to actually apply for a scholarship. It was a condition of a scholarship that you worked that number of hours. So tutoring helped, but of course this detracted from the time I needed to work on my thesis. So I suppose the lack of um, part-time postgraduate scholarships was the second hurdle that I encountered. But fortunately, a research grant from the Australian Criminology Research Council came to the rescue. And normally, um, they did not give any grants at all for postgraduate research. But um, because I was enrolled part-time for my research higher degree, they made an exception and decided, well, perhaps they could fund, they could fund um, this kind of research although it was highly competitive, so I was pretty lucky, I must say, to get a grant from them, which helped pay for childcare. So I finished my thesis in July 1978, just before my 30th birthday. And on the strength of my LLM in a criminology-related subject, I was given the opportunity to teach the year-long criminology course at the law school, as well as teaching criminal law. However, I was still only a casual. <coughs> And I will remember being asked to help with a conference at the law school in 1980. I, get, I helped with the organisation and gave a paper at the conference. And academic staff at the law school had the registration paid for by the law faculty. But I was told that as a casual, I was not eligible to have mine paid and that it would be okay, I could just claim it from my income tax. But I was quick to point out that actually I didn't earn enough to actually pay any tax. Um, so I think actually then they felt a little bit sorry and decided perhaps they should pay for it, given I'd helped the conference. So by 1981, both of my daughters were at school and I was offered a one-year contract to teach criminology and criminal law. This was my first full-time academic job. <coughs> So I was the most junior and only female member of the academic staff in law. Across the university sector at that time, just 16% of full-time academics were female. So whilst I was the most junior, I certainly wasn't the youngest member of ac academic staff. My male contemporaries were by now seven or eight years ahead in terms of full-time employment, with all the leave and superannuation entitlements that went with that including um, study leave, which is a marvellous thing for academics. <coughs> so fractional appointments, which are so useful for a person who's the primary carer of the family, were just not available. However, eventually I did catch up. So juggling work and family was always a big issue. However, I must say that the flexibility of academic life made things easier, because working from home was always an option. So I managed to pick up the girls from school most days, straight after school, and I could work at night after they were in bed. And working after dinner in the evenings became a lifelong habit, which I still do. I kind of feel it's odd if I don't <laughs> go back to my desk at night. So I crammed it in. I used every scrap of the day. I worked on the kitchen table with children crawling over me. I took work to the swimming pool whilst they swam. And quite often I got up early in the morning when everybody was still in bed just to squeeze in an extra hour 
of class preparation or marking. And I must say, I had a helpful, supportive spouse. And I really enjoyed my work, worked hard, and played hard as well. So I think I probably said yes far too often, but in many ways this led to lots of great opportunities to work on projects that others um, had not back. So in the end, um, that worked out well. So gradually I progressed up the academic scale. <coughs> so from 1992 to four, I was Dean of the Faculty of Law. And then from 1994 to seven, I was head of school. And then in 1996, I was made a full professor. In 2001, the Tasmanian Law Reform Institute was founded and I became its first director and continued in that role until my appointment as governor, which was something that I held in conjunction with being a, a researcher and a teacher at the university. <coughs> so how is it that I managed to be promoted to the position of professor by the age of 48? <coughs> I think most importantly, I had a full-time job with flexible working hours and the ability to work at home. So the three o'clock pickup was um, manageable for me, even though I had a full-time job. And getting the job done was emphasized rather than spending hours in the office. And also working in a very collegial department helped. So I had the benefit of trusted mentors who really helped me negotiate the academic game, which is a bit of a game, in coaching me how to be strategic when to apply for promotion, pushing me to apply for promotion, and um, helping me develop influential professional networks. And I found a disciplinary area that really absorbed me, was under-researched, and was so full of opportunity. So another key factor was having a supportive spouse and also family help with caring responsibilities for my children when they were young. So I didn't have a working mother as a child, as a role model, but both, both my mother and mother-in-law really supported my career and they were always ready to help in school holidays or if one of the girls was sick. And um, there were things like tennis camps and school holidays, which I must say my girls tolerated and probably even quite enjoyed. I noticed that they send their kids to tennis camp now. <laughs> As the children became more independent, I also had the opportunity to work longer hours. And as I said, working from home was always an option. So I was able to accumulate a reasonable research record long before retirement loomed. And I know that's sometimes a problem with other academics. By the time they get to the stage of having a reasonable record, it's time to retire. So for me, conditions were really in my favour. So we've really learnt that in order to close the gender pay gap, achieving equality in education participation is just not enough. We know educational attainment for women has been steadily improving. So for more than a decade, girls have been consistently more likely than boys to gain year 12 qualifications. And since 1987, they've been more likely to be higher education students. In contrast, in the 50s, 1950s, only one in five university students were female. And when I was at university, it was just one in four. So one of the explanations for the over-representation of women in universities today is that entry into qualifications which are traditionally dominated by women like nursing and teaching, now require university qualifications. Another explanation is that young men have more vocational options than women outside um, the tertiary sector. The movement of women into previously dominated professions, dominated by males, is part of the explanation for equal participation in tertiary education, but this has really been patchy. In law, for example, a majority of graduates are now female, but it's certainly not the case in engineering and probably science. In these areas, women are underrepresented. And the analysis of the gender wage gap suggests that the gap in graduate salaries, at least for recent graduates, could be narrowed if girls did change their selection and chose more STEM subjects um, at school, during secondary schooling. 
However, of course, this is only a small part of the solution. I think the focus on the salaries of graduates who are under 24 in their first postgraduate job really does obscure the later obstacles that women encounter in the workforce, which lead to this gender pay gap, and particularly to women's low superannuation balances. And I think law here does provide a good case study. Here, the gender pay gap is worse in the legal profession reported to be almost 36% compared with the 18.8% in November 2004. So why is it that there are so many women law graduates, but so few female partners in legal firms, so few silks, QCs, so few judges? Female law graduates outnumber males, and a study by the Law Council of Australia has found that 61% of solicitors in 2013 were female, but they were half as likely to be partners as males. And it seems that at the bar, only 8% of practicing silks are females, and these are the best paid um, lawyers in the legal profession. The proportion of judges ranges from 20, 28 to 37% in all states and territories, except the ACT. So what happens is that women evaporate from the legal profession post-admission, or at least they pull back from full-time work and their career prospects suffer. The Law Council's attrition study found that 50% of part-time women with family responsibilities reported discrimination, compared with 19% of full-time women. Now, there's a study of 66 organisations by the Workforce um, Gender Equality Agency, and this showed that law firms do offer greater flexibility than industry in general. However, it's been reported that some firms actively dissuade lawyers from taking up these options, and they reserve the interesting or challenging projects for full-time employees rather than part-time employees and resistance to encouraging flexible work practices is said to concern, stem from a concern that clients prefer to work with lawyers who don't have, um, who don't have commitments that limit their availability for work. So lots of women opt out of the law profession. They leave the higher paying jobs. They don't aspire to partnerships. So to some extent, this is a matter of choice, but it's a constrained choice. Pregnancy and caring roles significantly reduce women's ability to earn comparative salaries. Having children means that three quarters of working mothers take the opportunity to change their working lives in some ways, um, either to work part-time, to negotiate flexible working hours, to work at home, or to undertake shift work of some kind but only a third of working fathers with children under the age of 11 change their work patterns in any way at all. In fact, on average, fathers slightly increase their working hours by four hours a week after the birth of their first child. <laughs> so, in how many families is the father the primary carer of children? Well, of Australian families with kids under 15, 60% have a father who works full-time and a mother who works either part-time or not at all. But only 3% of such families have a mother who works full-time and a dad who works part-time or is at home. So even if both are working full-time, women tend to take primary responsibility for children, which we've already heard. And in a global executive survey cited by Annabel Crabb, those who had children were asked the fundamental question, who takes most responsibility for childcare? 57% of the female senior business executives did. Only 1% of male executives did. So many explanations have been offered for the gender pay gap, stereotyping, industry and occupational segregation, discrimination, women's poorer negotiation skills, reluctance to apply for promotion, 
and so on. Unconscious bias we've heard about. And um, there's a range of solutions, quotas and so on. However, I would really like to focus most, I think, on work flexibility and domestic responsibilities. So echoing Annabel Crabb and other commentators, I think it's really important to focus on normalising flexible <laughs> work arrangements and breaking down that male breadwinner model. So in doing this, we need to change perceptions of what it is to be masculine so that it's okay for men to share the domestic load. Okay for a woman to have a, a higher status, higher earning job than her partner. So I think we need to change the stereotypes of what it is to be male and what it is to be female. Mm. So in an article I read in the Australian two weeks ago, Shane Rogers suggested that post-GFC, progress towards equality for women by making women's and men's working lives more balanced and achievable has really stalled. She said, the job market is tight and everyone <coughs> wants to be seen to be working really hard. Don't even talk about flexibility. It's a sign of weakness and flaky commitment. So Rogers argues that the following are signs that this is so. She said, women with kids spend more time apologizing. Even if they've completed their hours at work, they feel guilty about leaving to pick up their kids while so many others are still in the office. We treat part-time work as a problem. Employers can be hesitant to allow it, treat it as a lack of commitment, or marginalise employees as a result, as we've seen in the legal profession. It does present difficulties for employers, but it should be treated as an opportunity to retain talent to foster loyalty and to keep families functional. And we still think work is about turning up, but long hours don't make us more productive. Nearly all credible research shows crazy hours <coughs> make us unhappier, unhealthier, less creative and less efficient. <laughs> so Rogers argues that this is not a problem for governments or legislation. It's really a problem of the attitudes of management and men need to champion this too. Whilst I'm not so convinced that women are spending more time apologising, I think they've always apologised, or that part-time work is treated as more of a problem than it once was, I think it's always been treated as a problem. Certainly attitudes towards flexible work practices are really stalling progress towards gender pay equality. <coughs> and Rogers' arguments are echoed by Helen Conway, former Workplace Gender Equality Agency Director. She says it's time to end the notion of long work hours as a badge of honour. And in the case of law firms, of seeing long hours at the desk as a path to partnership. She argues that we really need to prioritise getting the work done rather than working long hours at the office. Workplaces need to mainstream flexible work. And this, she argues, is not just about women. A lot of men also want flexible work, particularly younger men. I agree with Helen Conway. I think until we have more flexible working arrangements for men and women, until part-time work is seen as real work and you're not discriminated in the workplace if you're part-time, it needs to be seen as part of career progression and not just a token job. Until we have more equal sharing of caring responsibilities between men and women, we won't see equality in the workplace. And this requires changing attitudes about what it means to be masculine. We need to make it more acceptable for men to work flexibly, to take paternity leave and to accept that the primary breadwinner isn't necessarily a bloke. And I think we need to support women who work so they don't feel guilty about leaving work to pick up the kids or from, to pick up them from childcare. Or we, don't, we need to stop them feel guilty about staying at home if a child is sick. And our mothers shouldn't feel guilty for working and not being a full-time stay-at-home mum. We know from recent research that far from being disadvantaged, the children of working women benefit by having a working mother as a role model. 
So using data from 24 countries, including the UK and the US, a Harvard study found that the daughters of working mothers enjoy better careers, higher pay, and more equal relationships, which is most important, than those raised by stay-at-home mothers. Moreover, having a working mother was shown to have a positive impact on boys, with sons raised by an employed mother taking a greater share of parenting and other household care roles. So this is not to denigrate the stay-at-home mum, as Nikki Gemmell was at pains to point out in a recent comment in her column. I think we need to respect each other's choices. But we also need to recognise that the choice to opt out of the workforce to raise, ch raise children or to downshift to part-time work or to go for a more accommodating, perhaps less financially rewarding job is for many women a constrained choice rather than a real choice. It's a poor way to describe the circums circumscribed career moves that mothers make when trying to factor in childcare. So a recent survey of about 1,500 professionals in Australia and New Zealand has found that 88% of job seekers were more likely to consider a role if flexible work arrangements were advertised. However, the same study showed that there are barriers to creating a culture where employees feel they can take up flexible working arrangements. So over half feared that co-workers would judge them harshly for working flexibly. And 43% said they worried that adopting flexible work practices would have ne negative career consequences. So these are, are promising developments, or there at least there are some promising developments. In the legal profession, the Law Council of Australia has recognised that there's a need to normalise work flexibility to address the problem of unconscious bias and the attrition of female employees. And it is following up a baseline survey to measure progress in changing workplace attitudes. Women Lawyers Victoria is working on this issue and has released a best practice guide with six protocols that cover parental leave, part-time work, job sharing, flexible work hours, and working remotely. And in the wider community, Male Champions for Change um, was launched in 2010 by Sex Discrimination Commissioner Elizabeth Broderick. And this invites business leaders to pledge to advance <coughs> gender equality within their organisation and to act as public advocates on the issue. So just to close, I would like to bring this all back to my experience of the gender pay gap. So in, the, in my early years post-graduation, there were certainly obstacles. At the age of 30, I was well behind my male contemporaries with a poorly paid job as a casual academic and no eligibility for study leave, superannuation or long service leave. But I did have an honours degree, a postgraduate degree and some, some teaching experience as well. So 10 years later, at the age of 40, I had a tenured full-time job as a lecturer. But in terms of career, I was still well behind my male contemporaries and younger male colleagues. However, I had a job that I loved, and despite being the primary carer of my two children, I had the flexibility to work at home, and I had a helpful spouse and extended family. <coughs> so by the time I was 48, I'd been promoted three times and was a professor. And managed, I had managed to overtake many of my male contemporaries. And by the time I resigned from my salary position at the university last year, I even had a respectable superannuation balance. <laughs> so in my case, it was the flexibility of my work. The fact that promotion was determined by outputs, primarily by research grants and publications, mm -hmm. rather than hours spent in the office. Mm -hmm. So this explains how I think I managed to juggle work and caring <coughs> responsibilities and to crack that glass ceiling. So thank you. Thank you.